Thank you for still being here. And um, my name is Antonia. I'm here from the Center for Financial Regulation and Inclusion. We are an independent, not-for-profit think tank based here in Cape Town. We're about 50 um, economists, lawyers, business development people, all trying to understand what is the role of the financial services industry or the financial sector in people's lives um, from a consumer perspective. So we're all about the consumer and really seeing financial services as a tool to unlocking greater economic prosperity and greater economic um, welfare, especially in emerging markets. I personally started my remittance journey fairly recently. I'm only in um, this space for about three years, two to three years. And we started this um, in conjunction with our funder, um, FSD Africa, to really, from a perspective of the high costs, I mean, you've seen it before, uh, the 21%, the 19%, the and that is only the transfer cost, right? That's not actually the opportunity cost the travel cost for people to actually go in cash, um, the remittance they send or they receive. So we quickly realized that the data is not only completely dodgy, I mean, um, very dodgy, it also hides the majority of flows, uh, but especially what grabbed our attention was the high intra-Africa corridor fees. As we heard before, like 80% of migrants in Africa stay within Africa. They don't actually go outside. Yet most um, providers focus on the developed to developing country flows in terms of getting their hands onto Forex, but also because there you have the bigger amounts uh, and the more regular transactions. And um, as we also heard uh, before, the, a lot of the, the or what Rachel pointed out quite well is the, 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 the borders are quite arbitrary on this continent, so informal is really able to meet the needs of consumers in Africa much better than the formal system so far. So we then um, completed a diagnostic of the supply side barriers to remittances. So as providers, we asked a lot of you in the room um, and outside the room, as well to what, is, what makes it so expensive to operate in Africa. Um, it's not obviously to exploit the consumer, hopefully. There is real very, um, valid reasons why that is the case. And so um, I want to present to you today a little bit on that, but also what followed was to really understand the underlying infrastructure that we have in the continent already. Uh, we heard from MasterCard this morning, you know, they are bringing infrastructure outside the continent, but there's a lot of different initiatives on the go. And I, am, I don't have a good overview of all the different, different schemes that are happening. We heard from Gates, um, they, even within Gates, there are two different kind of infrastructure uh, projects happening. So there's a lot of interest, but there's a lot of fragmentation, there's a lot of lack of information, and meanwhile, the informal sector is still growing, um, the costs have been reduced somewhat, but not to, um, certainly not to SDG level, but the sustainable development goals we also see as a little bit of a, we, we're a bit frightened by the three to five percent because for, from a provider <coughs> perspective, that surely means you will only service the kind of urban areas, the ones that you can capture where you can get the scale and the rural areas where remittances are actually also obviously a, a very big part of, of um, surviving will be left out. So we're also strongly against this um, very strict cap of 5%. There is a reason why business in, in Africa is so expensive. Okay, so um, long story short in terms of uh, do payment systems support remittances in Sub-Saharan Africa? No. So uh, we can maybe go all home now, but if you want a little bit information, more information, you can stay. But what I do want you to take away is that um, it is, there are exciting opportunities happening, and I want to showcase some case studies um, today. So first of all, I want to do a little bit of lecturing on what a national payment system is, what are the different kind of elements of a national payment system, and I'm sure you all know more than me about national payment systems, but just to just show you why there are so many different, why, why it's so difficult to crack um, a regional or even, you know, an international system if a national payment system already uh, is so complicated. 
Then uh, payment realities in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I'm going to spotlight some of the regional payment system in sub-Saharan Africa and then what we see in terms of priorities going forward. Okay, so payment systems play an important role in helping to maintain financial stability and the reduction of the cost and uncertainty of settlement, which could otherwise act as an impediment in economic activity at the national, at the regional level. That's how the Bank of International Settlements uh, um, ident or, or uh, talks about national payment system or payment systems in general. So it's a lot broader than just remittances, right? It needs to support everything. So all the different risks need to be maintained. And we know the regulatory burdens around uh, payment systems can be quite tough. Oh, jumping ahead here. Sorry, this is very small. Okay, so a payment system is actually um, a set of instruments. It's a set of banking procedures, interbank transfer systems that ensure the circulation of money. So it is the means by which funds are transferred within an economy. And here you actually see the essential elements of a national payment system, which encompasses all payments related activities, um, processes and users in a particular economy. So I'm going to go quickly through um, the different elements. So in terms of the real economy, it very much depends on what your country, uh, the consumers and also the supply side in your country, in terms of what you really need. For example, informal economies, like a lot of uh, uh, African economies, will largely operate in cash. Um, so where a more developed economy may need a more digitized payment system. So it's often fit for purpose, or should at least be fit for purpose, um, depending on what your economy needs. Channels represent the various pathways um, that can be taken to send money, while the instruments are the tools used to effect payments through the various channels. So those are often a little bit confused. I confuse them as well. It's not entirely clear anymore what is a channel and what is an instrument. But as, as we uh, move into the future, hopefully those will converge anyway. Processing of payment orders involves sending and receiving of payment messages for purposes such as authorization requests, etc. And then you have clearing and settling, um, where clearing refers to the transfer of transactional information. Um, that determines really the obligations of the several parties and settling is then the actual exchange of value. Settlement can be real-time in the more um, advanced um, systems, so where clearing and settlement happens exactly in one transaction, or there can be deferred settlement, which is also very common, that settlement happens in batches, you know, either several times a day or T plus one, T plus two. So um, real-time settlement is very important for systemically, um, for, for, it's for criti is, are critical for systemically important payments or, you know, your wholesale larger value um, transactions. And um, the small payments or the low value transactions, they carry lower risk, so they can be settled more in batches and as to not to clog, uh, um, clog up the real-time growth settlement systems in the various economies. So increasingly, there is a requirement for real-time clearing, uh, even at retail level with deferred settlement, to ensure higher ir irrevocability because, of course, we know um, all about fraud and about consumer trust. So these um, systems really increasingly um, need real-time um, clearing, at least, um, to enable merchant and spot payments. Um, so supporting infrastructure is really what underlies or underlines all of these systems. So if you don't have the electricity, you don't have the network uptime, don't have the roads, I mean, um, you can't stock your ATMs. As a provider, you will not go into the rural areas because it's so expensive to get cash out of into these areas. So a lot of providers don't have actual control over these things, right? Uh, there are massive infrastructure investments that need to happen. And technology has only been partially able to overcome some of these. I mean, you do have offline um, transactions and USSD and all that, so at least you don't need a smartphone and, and all that. But in general, on the continent, we still have a massive infrastructure problem that is not as easily solved um, just by an app, unfortunately. 
So in sub-Saharan Africa, both infrastructure and regulation have developed at, ver uh, at very different paces. So that makes it very difficult for people to understand the various national payment systems. There's a lot of national interests, um, pride, uh, political instruments. There's a lot of elements in a payment systems that uh, in a payment system that need to be considered, and any tweak will affect literally the whole payment system and not just in the remittance sector, for example. I don't want to really go into national payment systems. Um, just to mention quickly that on the continent we do have some champions. So if you look at the Nigerian national payment system under NIPS, uh, it's very well developed. It's set up in a way that looks into the future, that is able, if not now, in, in future, accommodate newer technologies, newer standards. So it's really built with future in mind. Um, Tanzania, uh, Namibia, Cote d'Ivoire, they all show also a, a kind of a, a strive towards more modern modernization or they're thinking about, you know, um, especially in the case of Namibia, leasing infrastructure instead of buying their own um, for their really small economy compared to South Africa. So there are some highlights here and there. I really want to um, focus more on the regional payment systems. Um, we're going to get to that just now. So let's talk about what are the payments realities in sub-Saharan Africa um, based on our research. I mean, we've heard it time and time again, cash is king, uh, it's still the, the, the word to go by. Um, other paper-based channels or instruments um, such as checks have been incre uh, decreasing in popularity, but they're still very prevalent. Um, important mechanisms in many sub-Saharan African economies, I believe West Africa is also um, still high up there, so it's really not the more advanced technologies um, that are to be debated. It's even the, as simple as going from a pace, uh, uh, going away from a paper-based system. EFT, um, POS, and mobile channels are on the rise. So in Tanzania, for example, the annual check value decreased by 34 percent between 2013 and 2015, and POS increased by over 270 percent. So there is a definite shift, um, but cash remains by far the most widely used instrument. So in this figure, the real-time gross settlement system that every economy uh, in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa has quite well developed um, is at the center of the digital ecosystem. So what you can see here is a, 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 an attempt to graphically uh, put together the dig digital ecosystem in Sub-Saharan Africa. The second circle around that shows um, the instruments, and the third circle shows the channels, and then the outermost circle shows the cash economy, and up to, up to, uh, to date, it's still 80 to 90 percent of payments in Sub-Saharan Africa are made in cash. And uh, we've heard it again before, that's going to stay for a while. So. Um, very few digital instruments and channels touch the cash economy, which are these blue circles. So there's really not a big penetration uh, in terms of what the RTG, how the RTGS I I interacts or, you know, the, the kind of central part interacts with the cash economy. So, um, for example, the e-money instrument the, uh, can be facilitated through the agent channel. So the pathway interacts with the cash economy because consumers cash out e-money through the agents. Um, and as such, the pathway is connected to the dominant cash economy, but not fully, because consumers are generally unable to engage with, the re uh, with retailers without first in cashing. So you do have um, that, that cash link. So this puts into perspective the limited scope that digital channels or instruments are having in sub-Saharan Africa still. And yes, mobile money has become the largest digital channel in many sub-Saharan um, countries, and it's become systemically important in many economies as well in terms of values, um, uh, annual volumes. And this is particularly true for countries where pre-existing channels and instruments for digital payments are not already well developed. Um, so, like Tanzania, Cote d'Ivoire, and Madagascar that we also heard before about. Um, many, unfortunately, many sub-Saharan, and I think this is uh, true for uh, globally in many emerging markets as well, uh, many sub-Saharan uh, African countries insist on processing locally um, instead of regionally or internationally. And as we will discuss a little bit later, this means that many countries do not process large enough volumes um, or, volu uh, or values to uh, achieve sustainable scale. Um, 
So all case study countries we looked at, which were nine in total in the region, they have well-developed RTGS system for large payments, and then as well as relatively well-developed deferred settlement, low-value EFT systems. So there is some infrastructure in place, but it's not uh, it, the, the de degree to which, to which it's developed is um, not equal. So while systemically important payments can be effectively made, leading to more economic activity, uh, the region also shows there is an increased tendency towards lower value retail and micropayments, uh, which can actually support remittances. So we are back at the remittances. Um, the continent is dominated by correspondent banking relationships. We, we know this, um, but we are hoping that in future the regional payment systems can also make some headway and uh, maybe co complement or even... Uh, substitute them. So this is what I was talking about earlier. It might look a little bit intimidating at first. This is uh, a consolidated view of the research that we've done where all of the supply side experts and providers on the continent, well, I want to say all, it's definitely not all, um, we asked a lot of them to give us what are your top impediments in terms of doing business in the continent. And there are four broad categories that came up um, in terms of we, we tried to bucket them. They don't fit neatly, but um, business case, infrastructure, regulation, and consumer-facing barriers. And um, as you can see, um, oh, this thing, sorry, technology, gosh. So a good proportion of the audience input into this research, so I hope you all agree. If not, then you can come grab me after. So what is actually clear is that infrastructure, which includes national payment systems, is a very strong impediment for providers. So um, the first column, the cited column, is how often it was mentioned. Um, the darker, the more it was mentioned by, by literature and by experts and by supply side. Whereas we then went ahead and analyzed in terms of cost and access for the consumer, what is really uh, how bad is the impact on cost or, or um, access for the consumer. And definitely what came up a lot is regulation and infrastructure. And I think that is not um, a very surprising outcome. Um, in the cash economy that is sub-Saharan Africa, the lack of last mile infrastructure came up as a major barrier. As we know, people need to be ca able to cash in and cash out. Um, and one, if one can't use the digital value that is sent to them via an app or what, whatever way, then of course it's not going inc to uh, increase the adoption and the use and you're actually not doing the consumer a big favor. So what we know is in terms of remittances, it's often the recipient that dictates the channel through which the, um, through which the remittances should be sent. So if there's only a Western Union agent, then of course the sender has to go through Western Union. So it's really, and it came up, I believe yesterday, I wasn't here unfortunately, that networks is really where it's at. Your agent force really also determines how deeply you penetrate and how much of the market you're able to grab. And um, yeah, we have a lack of interoperability. I mean, it's been discussed at large already. Um, I think a lot of things are happening, a lot of things are moving, but it's still on uh, front of mind for people that really the lack of interoperability, not just between banks or between MMOs, but everybody should just get along with everyone, right? In an ideal world. So let's look at some examples of payment systems in Sub-Saharan Africa. We have a multitude of regional payment systems in Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'm hoping that at some stage all these acronyms are going to make sense. Um, I certainly can't um, remember them all. They're all uh, crazy. But I don't, I'm not going to go through all of them. I just want to pick out a few. But um, all of these are fairly young, um, but years in the making. Uh, and that is just one thing I want you to take away, is how long it takes to get people to agree on something um, with all the various elements we just discussed, to put all the technical stuff in place, you know, get the regulator on board, get the, the providers to cooperate or to co... What is it? Co-opetition? Uh, anyway. Um, what, is, what, what should be a co cooperative space versus what should be competitive space? All these things need to be discussed. Um, so 
Several regions integrate economically to promote open trade. Currently, we all know Africa has a little bit of a problem with trading relationships with each other, and pol uh, politically, it's a little bit difficult. But there is a large push by central banks to really, they want, they want this is the, the, the time now, to open for trade, and maintaining national payment systems become, can become a hindrance to cooperation, and we'll go through a little bit. Um, of that. So this is the list of regional payment systems that are developing in sub-Saharan Africa to boost economic development and they're by no means all finalized but just to show you it is happening. Let's look at SADC quickly. So the Southern African Development Community um, region, uh, Real Time Growth Settlement System. So SADC has 15 member states, 333 million um, people that it potentially touches and it wants to foster regional financial integration. Um, they are, at the core are the principles of interoperability and cooperative space, so they already have it in their mandate or as their goal um, to do that. And the interoperability brings all member countries and their banks together to share the same platform to facilitate cross-border cross cross payments. The RGGS became operational in 2013 and it allows banks within SADC to settle payments between one another in real time. So that means that banks can maintain their correspondent relationships but eliminate any interbank settlement risk in intra-SADC cross-border payments. There's currently 14 countries that participate, uh, 81 banks, of which seven are central banks. Um, it's hosted by the South African Reserve Bank. Uh, and clears, uh, settles in rand, and I think the US dollar has now been added as well, so it no, it no longer is only rand. Banks and non-banks are authorized to participate in the settlement system if, they, if their home countries are permitted, if, if their home countries permit them to. So it's still um, up to the national regulation to authorize who and who and who can't and can participate. The RGGS has really shown impressive growth. Um, in June 2013, there were only 500 transactions worth around, I think, 800 million US dollars um, that they pro that it processed. But by January 2019, so more very recent, the number stood at almost 1.3 million transactions worth over 400 billion dollars. So in a very, quite a short amount of time, they, there has been a really uh, a lot of growth. So when one considers the fees that were saved in terms of correspondent banking relationship and the volume of regional trade, the SADC RTGS plays an important role for regional integration. And just if you look at um, the number of countries, it's quite an impressive um, thing to be able to pull off. So basically what, what, what SADC did is that they all put money together and they bought a big piece of infrastructure that everybody connects to. But this of course means that um, they need to split the fees. It also means that the national payment systems of each country need to be up to a certain standard to really realize the full potential. And I think that's, that's where they're still ironing out, where there's still work to be done. So it's still definitely not complete. We saw how expensive it is to send from South Africa, and I believe those were average figures. We know that there are um, definitely opportunities nowadays to send money cheaper than on uh, 21%. But this is a new, what, uh, TCIB, what is it again? The low value credit transfer cleared in real time, on a real time basis. System. <laughs> it, uh, in the middle sits BankServ, who has been authorized as the regional clearinghouse. It's now in its soft launch um, as of January. It includes two banks and two MTOs that are um, testing, or you know, that are yeah, that are trying to figure out how a, a low-value transfer real-time scheme could look like. It's been in the making for already three years, and I wish Arthur didn't have to run to the airport, but I believe um, with Ed Sheeran. In town, the traffic is a little bit crazy, but Arthur works for SADC um, Banking Association who has, been, who has been testing this and who's actually training central banks and others this week on this new scheme. Um, so it's been in the making for three years and he, he asked me to point out that that's because everybody 
had to be brought on board. It's literally talking bilaterally with a lot of people trying to get buy-in, trying to get them to understand what is needed from their side. And of course, everybody's being approached by different parties. So it's, um, it's been three years and it's, I think, another two years. Uh, I think 2020, they want to roll it out fully uh, and it's in so soft launch. launch. So SEDEC countries need to become comfortable with um, joint ownership of costly infrastructure, shared processing platform, and adoption of widely accepted international standards. Um, so existing, uh, there's exciting things in the making. Um, and the regional clearinghouse, the main value proposition is really there that it can reduce time and cost of cross-border payments and also reduce the need for bilateral agreements. So once it's all ironed out, hopefully this will bring a lot of relief to the region in terms of cost and hopefully also in terms of access. Let's talk quickly about East Africa. So the East African community um, experienced relatively strong economic growth over the past decade. Um, but unfortunately, this has generally not led to meaningful reduction in poverty or inequality, which we would hope that it would. So again, each Afri East African country in the, or in the EAC uh, has very well, where, uh, not very, but a well-established RTGS and EFT system. But each country differs in terms of national clearing houses. Um, so their time to process transaction, the cost of each system and the transaction sizes that are, processes, uh, are processed are different. Check and EFT processes are very expensive still. And most, what is important to note here, most big banks, um, most of the big banks in the East African community issue MasterCard and Visa cards, while smaller banks issue card support, su supported by domestic aggregators. So local card switches don't operate at scale, uh, unfortunately, and the development of a card payment system in the East African community is slow. So cards are not on the rise at a rapid pace. So instead of actually going the way of SADC and establishing an entirely new infrastructure, um, the East African payment system, the EAPS, uh, leverage its existing system of systems of participating countries to create a cross-border platform. So um, it is basically establishes bilateral accounts between each RTGS system in the region. And this is innovative as it doesn't require any additional infrastructure. So it's much cheaper to do that. So you don't need to share costs between each other. Um, it settles in local currencies only instead of the US dollar. Um, which means that the EAPS requires commercial banks to hold pre-funded settlement accounts in the currencies of each of the country. So that is not, very, uh, not a very good value proposition to the banks if they can have a MasterCard or Visa um, system that they have access to. So the value proposition is just not there. There's also a big confusion around... Uh, regulatory requirements and processes, uh, we've heard it before. So, for example, the customer due diligence requirements are very different from country to country, and time requirements for processing payments are also different. And then who, does the, who sets the standard? You know, there's all these political issues around that as well. So, the uh, East African uh, region was the only region in Africa, actually, that saw an increase in the number of foreign correspondent banking relationships since 2013. Everywhere else, the corresponding relationships reduced, but in East Africa, that's not the case. And this, plus the fact that there were already established, like, Nostro Vostro accounts and regional hubs, that really led to competing forces and reducing scale. So the EAPS is really not well used. In fact, over 70% of cross-border payments in the region used USD as a settlement currency, so we know that, um, it's un that the EAPS is definitely underutilized because it only settles in local currencies. So mobile money is systemically important. With 66 billion US dollars in 2013 um, going through the system, which is more than double that of cards, actually. And this can be attributed largely of the expansion of agent networks. I mean, we all know about Kenya. We know about Tanzania. So the agent networks were really what, what was enabled them to reach scale. So in 
conclusion on this, while it's not necessarily a problem that the East African payment system is underutilized because it didn't uh, invest in big infrastructure, it is really um, required that the countries harmonize in terms of regulatory requirements so that this system, which in its essence is really a, a good idea, um, can actually reach scale and can actually lead to a reduction in prices even further. Lastly, let's look at WAIMU, the Western, West African Economic Monetary Union. Is this gonna? Uh -huh. So, uh, eight WAIMU countries, mostly Francophone, they're all served by a central bank, the BCAO. Um, they all have the Central African franc, which of course makes everything a little bit easier for them. Uh, and the payment system operates similarly to SADEC so that they, they do have a uh, physical infrastructure that they all uh, contribute to. The Waymo financial system has seen considerable changes in the past five years, uh, mainly driven by flexible payment system regulation. And um, some say too flexible, some say not flexible enough. Of course, this will never be. You will never be make everybody happy. But um, it has led to the development of innovative financial services, so such as e-money issuers. There are five e-money, um, five EMIs, electronic money issuers, that are allowed to participate in the financial sector. But what is also true is that many financial service providers remain unconvinced by the business case of expanding their digital financial services offerings. Um, this is uh, especially into rural areas, and it's because of the, for example, strict interest rate caps um, that an onerous licensing requirements uh, for agents, so that they really don't feel like it makes much sense for them to go to penetrate rural areas or go even through that. Through, through that hassle. There are really low levels of financial inclusion in the region. Only 22% of adults have access to a bank account, and let's not even talk about usage, because most of these bank accounts are used as mailbox, or, you know, I get all my money, I withdraw it all at once, and so I'm only really using my account once a month. Um, the BCAO Regional Payment System Project um, produced high-quality basic infrastructure to deal with both wholesale and retail payments. And apart from the RTGS, there's a regional interbank electronic clearing system and a regional interbank card payment system. And of course, like I said before, the common currency really simplified the exercise. And while the infrastructure is high quality, the really the lack of financial inclusion negatively impacts the scale and the usage costs. Um, they really remain high, which poses a barrier to further payment system participation at the national and regional levels. The regional card payment system promotes interoperability, including for mobile instruments, which is great. Um, so you do have the first cross-border mobile money mm, not system, agreement, I think it was MTA, no, Airtel, Burkina Faso, and Orange, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, so they do flow cross borders, which you don't often see. I mean, anybody who's trying to get a sending license in Sub-Saharan Africa knows what a hassle it is. Um, the regulatory burden around cross-border transaction, however, is still high, uh, and it does limit the use of the payment system. And that's really because of a lack of coordination uh, between the different players, but also between the national authorities, like telecommunications licensing and regulation, again, is separate from cross-border, but they should be working together, so um, it's just a pain. Uh, electronic payments, and especially mobile money, are catching up in the region. Checks still dominate for non-cash payments, and meaning that paper-based instruments are still preferred. So the infrastructure is there. Regulation, to some extent, is there. It still hasn't gotten, gotten far enough. And I, um, we, we heard it in the panel before. It really is the time to act now and, and work on the regulators and remind them and to remind them again and whisper into individualist ears like, you know, leverage your, your kind of connections that you have. It is often a political game as well. Okay. Lastly, let's look at what should be happening in terms of the uh, 
going forward. So we don't necessarily believe in national payment systems if you're not a Nigeria um, with, what, 180 million adults. China, yes, it's very easy to reach scale there. Think regionally, at least. If you're not, I mean, internationally would be ideal, but we're never going to get there. But does Uganda need their own national switch if Kenya just bought a national switch that is ridiculously expensive and could process the entire continent? No, Uganda does not. So rather, you know, instead of... And I must say that from the donor community, there's also a lot of fault there because often kind of infrastructure is tied or countries uh, agree to put infrastru expensive infrastructure in place because it's uh, tied to sort of a loan agreement on, on, other, on other terms. So the donor community hasn't done many favors there, but the national to regional uh, conversion and, and also the thinking around that really needs to happen. And we are a little bit uh, scared that in the times of nationalism and, you know, uh, those kinds of things, that national is going to become more and more important. That's why we have to push back there and just make, kind of from a business case perspective, it really doesn't make sense, guys. You have to mandate interoperability um, or at least provide support to regulatory, uh, to, to kind of industry-led interoperability initiatives. We've seen it in many regulations that they suggest interoperability. It would be nice if you were interoperable. We have seen, especially in countries where you have a dominant player, that's not necessarily going to work. And I mean, that would make sense for me as a provider as well. So if you really want people to interoperate, you have to mandate it in the regulation. <laughs> this is only the interim step to actually creating ubiquitous channels and instruments. So it, it's going to come that in future you send from your mobile into bank account, whatever. You don't even know your instrument. It doesn't matter what you do. It will go there where you want it to go. So instead of creating an, one app that can do one, you know, account to account transfer, so only has one use case, that's all going to be fla uh, flushed out. We see it in other regions already happening. Uh, so for this continent, it will happen, and um, providers need to get on board and upgrade their infrastructure um, to be able to, to support the ubiquity of channels, which actually goes hand in hand with the technical standards. Your technical standards, your operating systems should be able to accommodate the technical standards um, it, that are internationally recognized, and that's only going to become more and more. So legacy systems, as expensive as they were, they probably, you will need to rethink um, investing in, in or upgrading the systems. Uh, again, the cognizance on the supporting infrastructure can't be emphasized enough. Uh, this also in obviously includes agent network forces. Uh, again, interoperability does a great job there. Um, but it needs to happen more. We need more agents on the ground. We need more face-to-face. -face. We need more cash so people um, actually digitize. If people can get cash easily, and then only then will they see the value proposition of digital, because for them it actually is becoming seamless if they can do it, you know, quickly and easily. It's so often what we hear from ShopRite, for example, people receive money from ShopRite, go to the ATM, or go to the counter, get the money in cash, and then spend it in ShopRite again. So it, it really, people want that status symbol. There's many reasons why people haven't um, switched to digital. And one big thing of that is that the value chain is not digitized, right? Uh, a lot of initiatives focus on the merchant, focus on the consumer. Why are you guys not driving each other digital uptake? When the merchant has to pay, pay his wholesaler still in cash. Um, the same thing happens with petrol, for example. I think, was it in Madagascar that um, one petrol station told us that they're not going to um, accept any digital payments because they need to pay the fuel drop guy in cash before that person drops the fuel. So the, the, the trust element is really not there. So don't just focus on one element of the value chain. Digitize everything so that there's a, a push to only accept digital payments. But cash is always going to be a thing, at least for the foreseeable future, and then ensure that the payment regulator has a mandate for consumer protection. We don't see that a lot 
um, in sub-Saharan Africa, that consumer protection is specifically covered. So in terms of digital, in terms of trust, irrevo irrevocability, it's this very important that the consumer is at the heart of regulation and is protected, but not overprotected, of course. Too much regulation, we've seen it in Nigeria and South Africa in terms of mobile money, is also not good. There needs to be a fine balance. So all of these things are obviously super easy to um, figure out, but it needs a concerted effort from all actors to really work together to, to further not only financial inclusion and payment system development, but really start um, seeing payments as sort of more a utility and not a service that you will, um, that will differentiate you from your competitors. Um, and if you want to know more, all of our public is, uh, all of our public, all of our research is publicly available on our website. We do a lot on AML, CFT, financial, uh, illicit financial flows, a lot of payments um, stuff and remittance stuff. We look into digital fiat currency at the moment or central bank, central bank fee, uh, digital currency that is coming, that is also going to be coming. And I think uh, I would have raised that point in the panel before, that that's going to be the next big thing um, that's going to make us strive towards uh, more financial inclusion in the continent. And yes, thank you so much for staying. Please engage with me uh, via email, anywhere, uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. And thank you for having me.